All right. Um, well, thank you all so much for being here with us today. Today, we are going to be chatting with Deborah Goodrich Royce about her fantastic psychological thriller, Ruby Falls. Deborah Goodrich Royce's first novel, Finding Mrs. Ford, debuted in 2019 to rave reviews. She divides her time between the Northeast and Florida, where she writes, reads, watches lots of movies, and spends time with her family. Deborah serves on the governing and or advisory boards of the Avon Theater, the American Film Institute, New York Botanical Garden, the Greenwich International Film Festival, the Greenwich Historical Society, the Preservation, sorry, the Preservation Foundation of Palm Beach, the Preservation Society of Newport, and the Prasad Project. She and her husband have restored more buildings than she can count, including the Ocean House Hotel and the Deer Mountain Inn. Deborah holds a BA in French and Italian from Lake Erie College and an honorary doctorate from the same institution. In an earlier life, she was an actress in film and television and a story editor at Miramax Films. Ruby Falls is her second psychological thriller and she owes a debt of gratitude for its inspiration to Daphne du Maurier and Alfred Hitchcock. And before we get started, I just wanted to briefly touch on a couple of our other upcoming events. Uh, tomorrow, Thursday, April 28th at 6 p.m., we'll be hosting Riley Black in store to talk about her book, The Last Days of the Dinosaurs. And then this Saturday, April 30th, is Indie Bookstore Day. Indie Bookstore Day is modeled after Record Store Day, and it's just a nationwide celebration of independent bookstores. Uh, we have a full like roster of author events and activities planned, along with exclusive merch you can only get on Indie Bookstore Day. And we invite you to join us on our social media platforms or in store. And if you want to learn more about that, uh, you can check us out at wellerbookworks.com. Uh, we're going to be ending today's discussion with a 10 to 15 minute Q&A. So if you have any questions for Deborah, just drop them in the YouTube chat box and I'll make sure they get asked. And then finally, if you enjoy this conversation, please consider supporting Deborah by buying her book and please consider supporting our bookstore by buying it through us. And I'll leave links where you can do so down below. Um, great, and then, yeah, without further ado, um, could you start just by telling us a little bit about yourself, your background, um, and kind of what led you to write this book? Sure, hi, thank you for having me. I. Uh love Salt Lake City, so it's very nice to be here. I was just telling you, uh, in one of my iterations, I run an independent not-for-profit movie theater, so I've come to your fair town more than once <laughs> for the Art House Convergence, where uh, cinemas from all over North America gather these, these little indies, very similar to indie bookstores, to talk about the life of being, you know, an in independent cinema. So my life, my adult life has really spanned those two art forms, uh, film and television and literature, the written word. So I'll, I've, it's fun for me to start a year ago. My mm -hmm. publisher called me and you can see the cover of Ruby Falls is quite gorgeous. It's this a little bit kind of sliced and diced uh, image of a beautiful girl with uh, a lot of chaos there. So he called me in January of last year and said, how about a triple electronic billboard in Times Square? And I thought, <laughs> now the reason the publisher would ask the author for that is because you know the author in the end pays for everything a cost associated uh, with the publication and the promotion of his or her book. And of course, my question was, how much would that cost to have this triple electronic billboard in Times Square? And the cost was so outrageously low, because if you recall, in uh, winter, spring of 2021, we were in the middle of a pandemic, really locked down at that point, and Times Square was shuttered. So the price was so low, I thought, you know, we should do this because we might not ever do this again. So a year ago, some girlfriends and I went into New York and stood and took pictures under this billboard. And I'm coming to the answer to your question. The triple billboard was over a doorway for 1515 Broadway. And 1515 Broadway 
is the entrance to the Minskoff Theater. Many decades ago, when, so I went to college, I majored in French and Italian, I was a dance minor, and I did a lot of theater because I was at a tiny college in Ohio. And a movie came to town called Those Lips, Those Eyes, which sounds slightly off color. It wasn't that, Those Lips, Those Eyes, it's a, a lyric from a song from Summerstock Theater. So this movie was about Summerstock Theater at the turn of the last century, and it starred Frank Langella and Tom Hulse, if you remember him from Amadeus. Anyway, I was cast as a background dancer in that movie and the choreographer was very friendly and he kept telling me, you should come to New York and audition for me. And being a good Midwesterner, I was very literal. I thought he meant specifically what he said. So I finished college early. I was back in my hometown of Detroit, suburban Detroit, working in an office, not really a, a clear plan of where I was going. And I picked up a copy of Variety, the theatrical publication, and in it was listed auditions with this fellow at the Minskoff Theater, 1515 Broadway. I called him on the phone. He didn't seem really too pleased to hear from me, but he said, sure, you can come and audition. I can't guarantee you anything. I flew to New York the next day. I crossed the threshold of 1515 Broadway. I was not cast in, he was casting uh, a season at the Goodspeed Opera House. And that is a leapfrog. That is sort of the wrinkle in time jump Mm -hmm. from how I got to New York, the first door I walked into and standing under that door as a writer all those decades later. And I thought if I could say anything to younger people, you are a lovely younger person. I would say you have no idea where your life is going. And if someone could have said to me, you know, listen, my dear, don't worry about this. This is not going to work out today. You're not going to get this thing. But you know, in several decades from now, you'll be right back here under the doorway with your name above it. So I, to be quick, I spent a year pursuing dance on Broadway. I wasn't quite good enough. I got close to everything on Broadway. I wasn't cast. I decided to give acting a try and I had a very different experience. I did a year of heavy commercials, you know, mm. Coca-Cola and uh, Cheetos, bacon flavored Cheetos, which was a failed product. You can imagine why, you know, Clearasil and Visine and all these other things. And then I was cast on All My Children, which was a very popular soap opera at the time. It ran for 40 years and I got a big contract role playing the sister of the star, which definitely makes its way into Ruby Falls. Mm -hmm. And I did that for a year and I was written out and then Paramount Pictures flew me to Los Angeles to screen test for something which I got uh, a project with Christopher Lloyd if you remember him and so I worked for a decade as an actress in film and television and had a ball got married and had two children and it, it was not as thrilling anymore to put the time and attention I was into acting. And my first husband and I, now it's the early 90s, we had an opportunity to move to Paris. Mm -hmm. And when we moved to Paris, he had a work opportunity. I started working as a reader for a French film studio and all film studios keep readers on the payroll. It's a freelance job and you, you know, read the screenplay or the book you synopsize it for the studio executives and you write a page or so of comments about all the elements of story that, and, and character and everything. So I did that. And when he, we came back to the US, he took a job for Julia Roberts who just done a deal with Disney. And I was hired uh, by Miramax Films as the story editor. So that's what I did in the nineties. Uh, so I went from acting to being a story editor. So uh, the way I went behind the, the camera was really through, through the script, through the story. And then I left Miramax because it was very taxing, but I continued to write on my own. Uh, I was in a couple of writing groups and I was doing a, this kind of quietly while I was raising children and doing other things. And for me, it was that, that empty nest moment where I thought I, I need to come out of the closet as a writer and, um, declare myself. And that was a good thing. So um, that's where we are now. 
Yeah, no, thank you. That's um, incredible. Like, yeah, it's, um, and you can tell, you know, like uh, that, that thread um, of like loving film, of that being a part of your life, how that carries through to the current day, but how you found yourself taking roles and um, positions that you maybe didn't expect to. Um, and one thing um, that I did want to ask you about is I've heard some actors talk about the craft of creating a character um, as very similar to the craft of writing you know, like in both contexts, you kind of have to create a, a world for yourself. Um, and I was wondering if you could speak to some of the similarities and differences between the craft of acting and the craft of writing. Well, that is really the vital point. You really hit the nail on the head. It is a very similar process. And when you're acting, you're playing one character among many, and you're doing it with a single character. When you're writing, you're really doing it with a whole cast of characters. And it's, it's an even more interesting topic when you add in the topic we're thinking about now, like cultural appropriation, who gets to write, what kind of character. I'm a middle-aged white woman. You wouldn't want to read my books if they were all just, you know, 15 middle-aged white women talking to each other. But when and how do you write another gender? When and how do you write another ethnicity or race? Mm -hmm. Very complicated issues, which we don't have to get into. But you, you are looking into each character um, in my first book, uh, Finding Mrs. Ford, there are two main characters, Susan and Annie. And I didn't really know how I would get into the head of Annie. She's kind of this wild and crazy girl, like a Zelda Fitzgerald sort of character. And I was on a trip to my hometown of Detroit and I was driving around and I went to the church just you know, randomly that I used to go to with my grandmother. I had a Belgian grandmother who went to a Catholic church. And I remember a tiny bit of my life when the mass was in Latin. So I pulled over, I walked into the church and I thought, oh, that'll be my way into that character of Annie. I, mm -hmm. as wild as she becomes at the point you meet her in the book, I'm going to give her a relationship with a grandmother and give her a foundation in this church. And it then, there was something to hang the character on. So I think as writers, we do that with all of our characters. You know, mm -hmm. what's my entry point into this character? Even if you're writing a villain, you need some sort of entry point of what is it about, will be gender-based, what is it about him that, you know, I can kind of latch on to, same as acting. Yeah, yeah, I love that. Um, I like just how you answered that question because another thing that I wanted to ask you was um, how much of yourself you put into the characters, like whether you take your own traits and other people's traits. And I, I, I think you already answered that. Um, well, but very yeah. much so. I mean, in Ruby Falls, when when our our girl uh, grows up, she's an actress who is written out of a soap opera. So mm -hmm. I took that. I didn't want to really set the whole thing someone asked me, well, why not set it all in a soap opera? And I thought, well, I don't know if that would be as compelling now because they're, they're really virtually gone. I think a little hint of it is intriguing, but um, she then is an actress in a, in a movie. And I think a movie is more comprehensible to most people mm -hmm. now. Um, but yeah, you, you put that stuff in because, you know, it's particularly if you know it well, you've got so much flavor that you can add. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Um, oh, another thing that I wanted to ask you about, um, you do such a great job of just dropping these little breadcrumbs of information as you're going along. It's so fun to piece together. Um, and, and one of the things that I really love is that I feel like I, as a reader, get the information at the same time as Eleanor. Like, I, that's one thing that can be really frustrating about mysteries is like, oh, this character is so stupid, but I never feel that way about Eleanor. Um, but I wanted to ask you, uh, what was that process like for you as a writer? Did you know at the beginning, like where it was going, how it was going to end and how those pieces would fit together? I did not know. Uh, I, Ruby Falls came out of the clear blue sky to me. I mean, if you think about, you know, the whole concept of Elizabeth Gilbert's big magic, like sometimes these ideas just want to come out. The mm -hmm. first two chapters, I feel very much that they downloaded into my head. And I was almost just 
typing. I was the typist, the scribe for those first two chapters when she is a little girl is abandoned in the dark cave. And of course her childhood name is Ruby. The cave is called Ruby Falls and it's very much a double entendre, obviously playing with the meaning of that phrase. And then after you know this horrible incident where she's abandoned in this dark cave, she grows up, she's on the soap opera, she's written out, uh, she flies to Europe, meets the tall, dark, handsome stranger, Orlando Montague, marries him, and they go to the catacombs, where she, of course, has this attack of claustrophobia and has to leave. That all arrived whole as it was. And I thought, that's really interesting. I don't know what this is, but I think I need to explore it. So as I went along, I do a, a process it's not, I don't outline a full book, but I take copious notes mm -hmm. and I have this weird thing I also do where I keep a calendar for, you know, you can go online and find anything. So whenever you're setting something, you can find um, online, let's say you, you want to look at July of 1968, you can find a, a page that you can print out. So, you know, did the first fall on a Sunday or a Friday or whatever? And I jot little pencil notes in those squares because I think it's very important to cross reference mm -hmm. how you're holding this together and to be able to go back. And the visual of the calendar is extremely helpful to me. Great. So with her, she's, her father disappears in this cave. It is the seminal event of her life. It is shattering. And she becomes obsessed with the whys and the wherefores. So she becomes a little bit of a conspiracy theorist. And I didn't know what the answer was going to be as to why her father disappeared. Was he murdered? Was he taken? Did he walk away? And it was something that became, it sort of revealed itself to me as I went along. Uh, I, I won't say any more about that. But. I didn't know from the get-go. Um, could you talk uh, with us a little bit about um, the chapter titles that you chose? There are so many great little in-references um, throughout the whole book. Well, as you said, you use the term breadcrumbs. I love the idea of breadcrumbs. Another term they use now is Easter eggs. You know, you find a little Easter egg. So the titles... They're small literary puzzles, if you like that sort of thing. I don't mean that they're more complicated than they are, but they give a little hint of the content of the chapter. Uh, if you are a person who knows kind of the history of film and different books and Gothic poems, you know, you will recognize certain things. If you're the type of person who's not interested in that, it, it doesn't diminish not to pay attention to the chapter titles. But I just, for me, it was another source of amusement. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, that's my favorite thing about mysteries is um, the, the puzzle of piecing it all together. Um, I, I wanna say one more thing about breadcrumbs. My editor said to me a very interesting thing. She said, um, with, with Ruby Falls particularly, she said, I want you to rewatch the movie, The Sixth Sense mm. uh, and pay attention to when you come. She said, she said, people don't really want Agatha Christie anymore. The, the, the Agatha Christie setup was, in, you know, it's a locked room mystery, which it, there are a lot of good ones, but when it gets solved, you know, in walks this detective who says, well, it was, it was the chambermaid that you saw on page three. And you think, what? I didn't pay attention to that chambermaid. She said, so when you come to your big twist, and I have a super doozy twist at the end, she said, the reader will not have seen it coming. Mm -hmm. But when they get to that point, you want them to be able to see in retrospect, oh, there was a hint here. Oh, there was a hint there. And I think that's what we ended up achieving with this oh, book. 
absolutely and that that makes it so pleasurable to like reread and visit again and yeah I love catching things that I missed the first time around um and one of the things that I really enjoy about this is how you play with the ambiguity of like Eleanor's reality. Um, like as she doubts herself and her own perspective, we also doubt her perspective. Um, and I don't want to give too much away, um, but the character of Dottie is really fantastic. <laughs> um, and I love it's, Dottie. Yeah. And Dottie you know, she's a, there's a whimsical quality to Dottie. And I like humor in thrillers and that's very Hitchcockian too. Mm -hmm. I mean, he definitely, you did laugh when you were watching Hitchcock film it at different points, but Dottie, I just loved her. And, you know, there was a, a little bit of that, what came out of A Wrinkle in Time, mm -hmm. that those ladies, those what's this and who's it's and if you remember them. But yeah, I love Dottie. Yeah. Um, but could you um, speak to that a little, like one of the chapters is called Gaslight. Um, and you know, a, a lot of psychological thrillers kind of play with that. Uh, is this really happening? Is it not? Is there a supernatural force at play? Is this just in the character's head? Um, which is something that Hitchcock also does. Um, a lot of. And one of the other things that I really enjoyed while reading this is that it reminded me um, of a lot of different movies. And I, I was able to like see a lot of similarities and threads like Vertigo comes to mind, Rosemary's Baby. Very much so. Well, I mean, so a gothic thriller, a, a, a classic gothic thriller, it has hints of supernatural that I think in more contemporary Gothic thrillers, more youth oriented contem contemporary Gothic thrillers, very often it is supernatural, you know, Twilight or whatever. But in, in classic Victorian Gothic, it, it, things were often resolved in different ways that appeared to have been supernatural. If you think about Jane Eyre, it wasn't really a ghost in the house. If you think about the woman in white, what was going on? Um, but there's, so I think of, of the Gothic setup is, it's, to me, it's the, that very, uh, the setup of the damsel in distress. It generally, a young and vulnerable woman who comes under the sway or the influence of an older and more powerful man. And you can't tell if he is good or he is bad. And he appears to be bad and you don't really know where it's going. And in this book, it, it is a flight of fancy from the, the beginning of Rebecca. It certainly doesn't follow a, a similar conclusion, but if, if in Rebecca, you have the young and nameless heroine who meets Max de Winter in Europe, she marries him without knowing him, they go back to his house Manderley. We have the young actress, she meets Orlando Montague in Europe, marries him without knowing him, and they go back to Los Angeles. And so I loved, I love that kind of play. It's like mm -hmm. seeing, you know, things now, like seeing something like Bridgerton or something that's sort of a period piece, but using a multiracial cast. I just think it's so wonderful to play with concepts. I mean, it's what we've been doing with Shakespeare forever. Mm -hmm. We've been doing Shakespeare for hundreds of years. So what fun that somebody sets it in a, you know, a New York City garbage dump, or they set it in, you know, on the beach in Hawaii or whatever they do, it's, we all have to make this stuff our own and make it fresh. So the references to Rebecca, it is not a retelling of Rebecca, but it is, it is launched from there. And then, you know, it is a flight of fancy from that point. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, and yeah, I, it is a very playful um, book in a lot of ways. Um, I like that you use that word. Um, do you um, maybe have a passage or two from the book that uh, you'd sure. like to share with us? I'll read a little from the very beginning. And this is the prologue. And it is called Then, 1968, Lookout Mountain. I was standing with my father in the pitch black dark. 
the blackest dark I'd ever seen in the few short years of my young life, and the blackest dark that I've seen since, which is a considerably longer span. The surrounding air was dank with flecks from falling water. A disembodied voice rose up from the mist, then swooped back down to submerge in it. First amplified, then muffled, the sounds changed places, each taking its turn at prominence. The drone of the voice, the roar of the falls, and the clammy damp came at me from all directions, from the sides, from above and below, to seal me in a viscous coating and stick me to my spot. The waterfall could have been anywhere, next to me, yards away. I dared not move a muscle. The woman's words transfixed me with a tale of scuba divers, fearless swimmers who over the years had plumbed the depths of a fathomless pool in wetsuits and tanks, in masks and flippers. Down they had plunged into icy water in an effort to find its bottom no search had been successful. The roiling cascade dropped into a lake that continued, it seemed, to the center of the earth, to China, to horrible depths my imagination was fully engaged in conjuring. Cold drops of perspiration ran down my face, my arms, and the back of my neck. I was concentrating hard, trying to locate the source of her voice, trying to pinpoint the crash of the falls, trying not to move and tumble in, and trying not, most heartily not to be afraid when my father let go of my hand. That was it, really. That was all he did. He loosened his hand from my grip, and he disappeared never to be seen again, while the tour guide never stopped talking. July the 12th, 1968, the last day I saw my father. So that's the beginning. Yeah, thank you. That is such a terrific passage. I think that it sets the tone for the story so well. Um, and yeah, it's so eerie. Um, I Yeah, and uh, just your sense of atmosphere and imagery as well. Um, another thing that I wanted to ask you about uh, was if you could speak to some of the similarities and differences between writing a screenplay versus a novel, because you know, imagery is so important um, and sensations to both. Yeah, that's a great question. I don't feel it's my strength writing screenplays. I feel they're, um, they follow a very particular format where you're, you know, you're writing in camera angles and cuts and, you know, primarily dialogue, um, keeping the description to a minimum. And I just feel that I, I have more of a flow with, with writing novels and is, it's what I prefer, but yet I see it cinematically. I see it all in my mind and I want to convey it to the reader very particularly because I think it's one of the things I most enjoy in a book. Also, I tend to write real places. So Ruby Falls is a real cave. I set it in Los Angeles, particularly the Hollywood Hills, because in thinking about Rebecca and the setting of Manderley, there was something otherworldly about it. And the first sentence of the book Last night I dreamt I went to Manderley again. I'm, there's very much conveyed in that sentence that it's a, a, a maybe a slightly foreboding place. It's a place that she can't go. You don't know why. Um, there's a lot contained there. And I think that Hollywood is a very evocative place for most people on the planet Earth because we have all watched a hundred years of American cinema and we have seen over and over that place. We've seen the gates of Paramount Pictures. We've seen the Hollywood sign. We know what those twisty streets are with those particular lampposts. So I wanted um, that otherworldly setting and, and slightly dreamlike setting. I, I've described this book at times as a, a bit of a fever dream. It, it has a little bit of that feeling of, um, of a dream. Yeah, absolutely. Um, um, 
One of the things um, that you play with is Eleanor's role um, in this film that is heavily inspired by Rebecca and how her time acting in that eerily parallels what's going on in her own life. Um, and that kind of blurring of an actor um, getting really lost in their role. Um, is, is that something that you have experienced before um, yourself? Have you ever like taken your work home with you, you know, so to speak? So my first big part, as I mentioned, was the role of Silver Kane, the sister of Erica Kane on All My Children. And the storyline for Silver Kane was taken from the movie All About Eve. If you remember that movie with Betty Davis and Ann Baxter. So Susan Lucci, who played Erica Kane, was, you know, the star of the show. And I played this uh, sister who, who came in and, and uh, was very sycophantic at the beginning. And then you, you came to realize she was working to usurp the role of Erica Kane, very much like in the movie. So my part became increasingly dark and twisted. And on a soap opera, it's a very strange setup because you're working five days a week, 52 weeks a year, 12 hours a day. You go in at seven in the morning till seven at night. And I think more than uh, my experience in nighttime television or in films, you're so completely steeped in it because it just never ends. And I, I don't know what it's like now, there are only three soaps left, but you get voluminous amounts of fan mail or you know, anti-fan mail and just, the reaction of, of the viewers, they became so <laughs> involved <laughs> and um, they take it with the soap opera, I think because you come into their, their living rooms as this character, they associate you more with the character. So I did find myself very consumed by it, probably because it was my first role, probably because of the amounts of time. Also, when you're on a soap, you go home every night and you're learning dialogue for the next day. So it's really all you do. It, it, but it just, it sort of never stops. Like, well, I played that role and, and now I'm finished with it. So um, yes, I found it very emotionally taxing. That is the way to put it. It was quite emotionally overwhelming playing this character as she became more uh, out of it and kind of dastardly. Right, right. Um, and one of the things um, that I, I really enjoy is just how you play with uh, Eleanor's self-doubt and perception of self um, and how much that is influenced by, you know, the people watching her act, her husband, um, how, how much the people around us um, inform our own sense of identity. Um, I was wondering if you could speak a little more to uh, the, the dynamic between Orlando and Eleanor, because I think mm -hmm. Orlando is such a frightening character. <laughs> Terrifying character. Well, the female experience. I mean, one of the greatest books I think that's ever been written about a girl's journey is Reviving Ophelia. So girls, we females in our lives, go from being as little girls, um, really the subject of, of, the, of the world and observers. We are looking out We, are, you know, you think about that character, Harriet the Spy, she's going to solve those mysteries or going back in time, Nancy Drew. These are girls who are outward looking. They see the world, they know who they are, they have their confidence. And the point of reviving Ophelia is when girls go through puberty, very often, they go from being the subject of the story to the object of somebody else's story. They no longer define themselves. They, they, you know, tell me, am I thin enough? Am I pretty enough? Am I smart enough? Am I enough of any quality? This may or may not go on with boys. I can't speak about that it, with authority because I'm not one and I didn't raise boys, but I think it is a very typical female journey. And then I think the adult life of, of us as women is coming back to figure out 
what do I really think? What do I really like? So uh, Eleanor in marrying Orlando, and he is a very manipulative person. And I think for any woman who has been manipulated in that way, it's instantly recognizable. There are people who kind of set you up and you can get caught in something. There's a moment where he serves a dinner and he uses a particular dish and he's found something and he is just laying the groundwork for her to just walk into quicksand. And it's, it's very chilling if you've experienced that. Um, so yeah, that relationship. And he, I made him very exotic. He is Anglo-Chinese. So I, of course, pictured, um, what is his name? Is it Henry Golding, the handsome guy from Crazy Rich Asians and many other movies? That kind of guy who's really beautiful and has this, I think we as Americans just are suckers for English accents. <laughs> and you know, just the idea of marrying a stranger, you, you, it's really not a good idea in life, period. <laughs> don't do it, young women, just don't do that. Um, so, and there's a moment at, the, so on a soap opera, you know you're in trouble, and I'm playing a little bit with this. Uh, when a character on a soap opera says, you know, a tagline, and I've never been so happy before in my life. You see the thunderclouds moving <laughs> over her head because you know it's going to change. So there's a moment after the incident in the catacombs where they're on their honeymoon, they're about to go in the catacombs and a little tour. She can't go in, she has an attack of claustrophobia, has to be led out. And she knows she should tell Orlando about this thing that happened to her as a child, but of course she doesn't, but she, makes a comment of, you know, how tender and loving he is. And she asks the question, how did I get so lucky? Or words to that effect. And of course the reader should be a little ahead of her thinking, oh, I don't know. I don't know if you're really lucky at all. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you know, as like a young 20 something year old, um, I definitely can relate a lot to Eleanor, can see a lot of that. Um, and you're right, like if you have ever been in a relationship dynamic like that, there are just red flags going off the entire time. That's right, that's right. And she sees them and questions herself. And, uh, you know, people have different senses of radar about other human beings. People, some people have, you know, good sense and some people, you can be brilliant and not have good sense. Uh, so with her, her, her radar is a little off, you know, she, what happened to her as a child is taken a toll. Oh, absolutely. Um, and, you know, you talk a lot, like very explicitly about um, psychology in this, you know, she sees a psychiatrist. Um, did you, did you do any like particular research um, into psychology uh, while working on this? I did. I looked at a few elements of, um, yes, I did. I, I mean, without really getting too deeply into what's going on in the book. Yes, I did. Great. Mm -hmm. um, um, I really like how you spoke to um, Eleanor's experience um, and just like, you know, women's experiences growing up of starting as a subject, becoming an object. Um, and, you know, a lot of women are drawn to mysteries and true crime. And I think part of that is because a lot of women have their guards up. A lot of women are just kind of thinking about these things um, all the time. Um, mm -hmm. But I was uh, wondering if you could speak a little bit more to that as well. Why do you yeah. think that so many women are so compelled by mysteries? I think the world for a woman one aspect of the world, I don't want to define the entirety of our lives, there are elements of danger. There are situations that when we are young, particularly, 
uh, I will speak about myself, situations I walked into that I think, what was I thinking? And I raised daughters, uh, I have one stepson, but I didn't raise him. And it, you, there's so much in this world that has, things can come at you if you're not really looking, if you're not paying attention. And I think women are vividly aware of that. Uh, some more than others. My next book is based on a true crime. My mother's best friend was murdered at age 12 in Pittsburgh. And it's an unsolved crime to this day. And that had a, an enormous effect on my mother. And it also had an effect on me. So I, I perhaps more than many have a little bit of that radar uh, attenuated, but it didn't keep me from making really idiot mistakes. You know, uh, it didn't keep me from getting into really ridiculously bad situations where, and it wasn't until I was way down the path where, you know, the light bulb would go off. And I think that's something in looking back at youth. Uh, I'll give you a really minor example. And this happened in the last decade. I was at the DMV and I was standing in a line and there was a security guard in a security guard uniform. And he looked at me, he said, ha, you're in the wrong line. Your line's upstairs. I said, oh, okay. And I turned to go upstairs and he said, hey, do you do what everybody tells you? There's no upstairs in this building. And I was like, my brain cells are really like spinning right now because I don't even know what's happening here or why this is happening. But I thought, I'm a mature woman and I'm completely obedient to this guy in a uniform who's making some weirdo joke of for whatever reason. So that's a, that's a, an incident of no consequence. And I was not young when it happened, but I walked out of there thinking, what's the matter with me that I'm not that confrontational person. I'm not the person who's like, what do you mean? <laughs> it just would never cross my mind that somebody looking official would make something up like that. Anyway, if minor example, but you get the gist of it's weird. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And why um, would you question it? Right, right. But yeah, why wouldn't you question it? So a lot of it is, are we the paranoid person? Or are we, <laughs> I guess I'm very gullible, which sort of then leads to a certain awareness of bad situations. Um, well, we're going to open it up to audience questions. Now is the time if you have any. Um, but while we're waiting on that, um, I just wanted to ask kind of generally how you feel about film adaptations of books. Oh, boy, that's such a good question. <clears throat> so the Avon Theater, the theater, I'm pointing in the direction of it, like, you know, it's that way, everyone. Um, a few years ago, we do some book to film events and we work with a local bookstore and we brought in Marcus Zuzak who mm. wrote the book Thief, wonderful book. It was the 10 year anniversary of that book. So he came to talk and then do a book signing in the lobby. And he said, you can show the movie. I don't wanna see it. I don't like it. I'm not gonna be in the room. I just wait till I'm out of the room. So I thought, well, that's really interesting because I love both the book and the movie. Uh, so hard for me to speak about what he didn't like as a writer. So there's a trend now. Um, my first two books, my third book as well, which will be out in January. If I were to see them as any art form, I would see them as a film. Mm -hmm. And the first two books have been optioned by producers and they see them as these uh short, you know, limited series like The Little right. Lies, six, eight parts. So you kind of have to stretch it. You kind of have to add to it. And I'm not really involved with the process. So I don't know exactly. Uh, I, I know a few little things. So it is interesting. Look, when you write a book, when you paint a picture, Anything you do, it's yours and it's also someone else's. The minute you release it into the world, and that's kind of the point of art, is that there's an interaction between the viewer, the reader, and that art form. 
and it becomes theirs in a different way than it's yours. And I think it is very important for us to let it go. It is very analogous to raising children, very mm-hmm. analogous. Although with children, the process is so much longer. You know, at a certain point, they are not yours. They're just not. And you have to let them be something else. Yeah, that's that's such a great perspective to have and to bring to that. Um, and I, I do love the concept of the reader as like participant and creator in the reality of the art and how that's shaped. Very much so. Um, is there any advice that you would give to aspiring writers or just young artists? Yes, I mean, my journey has been sort of filled with twists and turns, uh, but I've always felt most myself when I'm in a creative capacity, whether it's acting or writing. And I think part of that for me has always been you know, absorbing, absorbing the world, other art forms, other books, other movies, uh, going to museums, getting out there in the world. The, the, the creator is really the observer, the person mm-hmm. who comes into a situation and is really looking at it and then, you know, adding their interpretation of what it is. So I guess I would say observe, observe, observe. Mm, wonderful. Yeah, I love that. Um, this is a pretty broad question. You were frozen for a second. Oh, sorry. Um, this is a bit of a broad question, um, but what do you think are the elements of a good mystery? The elements of a good mystery. So in my books, I like to think that I write identity thrillers. That is not a genre. It's not a thing. I would like to name it a thing because I think, so for me, I like a thriller that presents me with people and situations that may not be, most likely are not, what they seem. And the fun is sorting out and coming to that sweet spot between what a person presents and and the part that that person is concealing. And I like that to be revealed in sort of a steady drumbeat of little little bits and pieces. Well, like a peeling of an onion. I mean, for me, those are the most uh, intriguing thrillers. I, I'm trying to think of some that I've read in recent years. I like Tana French very much. Um, and there's so many, uh, I'm s- such good friends with so many thriller writers now that uh, there are just so many good thrillers out there. Yeah. Um, Well, in the last uh, little bit of time that we have here, um, I just wanted to ask, uh, what do you hope that readers take away from Ruby Falls? I hope that readers really enjoy kind of the wild ride with this very vulnerable girl and they take away, um, I, I would like them to take away a tenderness for her I guess, so sort of the enjoyment of the ride and a tenderness for the character. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. Um, It has been so wonderful talking with you about Ruby Falls. Um, Your love of like so many different mediums is so clear and so prevalent. And it's also just a terrific story. Um, Well, thank you for having me. I so appreciate it. And you're a delight. You ask excellent (laughs) questions. So this has been a treat. Oh, thank you so much. Um, Well, again, this was uh, Ruby Falls by Deborah Goodrich Royce. I will leave links where you can get it um, down below. And if you're looking for a good thriller, a good psychological horror kind of thing, this is, I I highly recommend it. Well, thank you so much. (laughs) Thank you. You have a good one. Bye.